please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. James Wayman. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for so much for being here and for making your way through the elements tonight. I know it took a lot for you to come out, and I'm very, very flat, flattered and pleased that you've done that. Uh, I've titled this Face Recognition. Uh, mostly, I'm going to focus on automated face recognition, but automated face recognition is always followed by uh, manual adjudication of prejudicial decisions. In other words, no one has ever said, no, you can't have this or you can't do something because your face does or doesn't match. So these are closely related systems, and in fact, we're working on standards for both of these systems together on numerous uh, government committees. So I'm going to concentrate mostly on automated facial recognition with the idea that we combine these automated and manual processes hand in hand. These are some headlines that I've pulled off the internet just in the last couple of months. There's no headline here that's older than about June of this year. You've seen these headlines. You've heard of the controversies surrounding automated facial recognition. And that's what we're here to discuss. I don't have any political agenda. Uh, whether you like these technologies or don't like these technologies, I don't particularly care one way or the other. But I get very, very agitated when I see the conversation being based on misinformation. And why is it that there's so much misinformation about these technologies uh, in the popular press, and even as far as misinformation in federal court findings? Uh, and one of the bar associations has a paper out on automated facial recognition that's wrong. When I think about why this is, I've got to look at myself and my own colleagues. We do a very, very poor job of talking about how facial recognition works. When we do talk about it at conferences and the like, we tend to use rather obscure, uh, arcane language. I think maybe it makes us feel like we're smarter if we're talking in a way that nobody else can understand, maybe not even ourselves sometimes. Um, and so it shouldn't surprise us at all that the rest of the world doesn't understand what we do. And so I really think that it's my responsibility and the responsibility of my immediate colleagues to start talking about what it is that we do and try to do it in plain, straightforward language. So here's what I want to talk about tonight, an outline. I want to give a chronological overview of the technology development. And the reason for doing that, if, it's like, if I can explain to you where we've come from, you will understand a whole lot better, I think, where we are with regard to the technology. I want to talk about how well the technologies work. We want to tackle this issue of racial bias that's been in the uh, news recently. We want to talk about case law. There's a whole lot of case law about facial recognition that may surprise you. Uh, we're going to talk about why facial recognition is creepy. Creepy, it turns out, is an academic term, which I'll be explaining here in a minute. We'll talk about existing legislation and some that's been proposed. Is facial recognition used for government tracking? That's something that we want to take on head on. And then we want to talk about some realizable use cases. Well, what can we honestly do with this stuff? that might make some sense. So let me start here with the earliest development of automated facial recognition, going back to the early 1960s, approximately 1964. Woodrow W. Bledsoe founded a company up in Silicon Valley called Panoramic Research Incorporated. And he had a tablet. They called it a RAND tablet. I've never seen one of these. I was just reading about it in his papers. It had a stylus, and I think what he did is he put the picture of a person on the stylus, and then he tapped where these anchor points are. You can see the anchor points maybe up around here. He tapped the tablet there, and it entered the x and y coordinates into a computer. He called this man-machine recognition because a person was responsible for tapping in the coordinate points on the face into this RAND tablet. <clears throat> and then he said, OK, what we have is a face is basically a sphere, and so we have these two-dimensional points that really are back on a sphere. So if mathematically I project those points onto a sphere and I have two faces, I should be able to rotate one sphere into the other sphere so that all these points line up if, in fact, they are the same face, right? And so that was the machine part. The people marked the points. The machine did the rotation of the points presumed to be on a sphere. And if you could get those points to line up, you say, same face. He had 2,000 2, photos, at least two per person, and he did 40,000 comparisons. Now, when you think about that, 
Suppose we have, um, I'll, I'll make a guess, suppose there's 150 people in this room. Suppose you brought with you two photographs of yourself. We could do 150 comparisons for which we knew the photographs were mated, that's the word we used. But we could compare everybody in the room to everybody else in the room, and we could do perhaps 150 times 149 non-mated comparisons. And then you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, that's probably not the right number. If I compare me to you, can I compare you to me? Sometimes you can. Sometimes these comparisons are asymmetric. But in the event that they're not asymmetric, we'll say, look, we can take half that number of comparisons. I can compare 150 people in this room to all the other 149 people that I haven't compared to and divided by two, and it's a very, very large number. So we can always do more non-mated comparisons than we can do comparis mated comparisons, and Bledsoe did about 40,000 comparisons in total, and said that within a few years it may be possible to attain realistic facial recognition by machine. What he meant is, without using this RAND tablet and the stylus to mark the points. Um, I've been very careful, I think, in this lecture to point out to my original sources. Much of what you hear from me probably will conflict with what you've read in the press, and so I think we will be able to make these slides available to you on the internet. Um, and I've pointed to the URLs of the papers that I reference, and unfortunately, uh, this paper was never converted to uh, electronic form and doesn't have a URL, although I have a copy. Um, I got it from University of Texas Austin, where Woodrow W. Bledsoe retired and became a faculty emeritus. Now, he stated that there are many reasons for failure to identify. Poor photographic quality, that is the texture, the lighting, the contrast, changes in expression, smile, mouth open, eyebrow raised, large pose angle variation, or I don't know, no reason. I can't figure it out. I got two very nice photographs of the same person, and they just don't seem to match. The reason I bring this up is if you've had to get your passport photo taken recently, one of the things they told you is don't smile. Look straight ahead. Don't raise your eyebrows. Make sure the lighting is right. There should be an 18% not reflective background, plain background to you. All of these things were pointed out by Bledsoe in 1966 is preventing the proper recognition of two facial images coming from the same person. So we've continued this up to today, even though some, what was this, uh, 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 54 years ago, uh, we had the same problems. Now, the question comes up is who was paying for this work? Bledsoe had a company up in uh, Palo Alto. Somebody was paying for it. We don't know who because in his papers, he doesn't credit his funding source. But after he passed away at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, in his obituary, his colleagues wrote, the funding was provided by an unnamed intelligence agency that did not allow much publicity. <laughs> well, that's interesting because the CIA has published one paper on their history of facial recognition, and it, it's downloadable. It's down here at the bottom. It was published in uh, 1997. And according to this paper, the first project at the Office of Research and Development, ORD, within the CIA was done in 1978. So the dates don't quite match with Bledsoe. And it's very possible that Bledsoe was getting his funding from the CIA, but not from the Office of Research and Development. That makes sense. Or it may be he was getting it entirely from a different intelligence agency. How many intelligence agencies are there now in the United States? Something well over a dozen, 18 or something, I think, in that order. So I called up a friend of mine that was working at ORD during the 1980s, and I said to him, tell me now what you can about this facial recognition system that was being run by the CIA in the 1980s. My buddy said it's face trace is what we called it. And he said, again, it was a manual entering of data points. And what we did is we looked at the relative distance between the eyes and compared that to the distance from the eyes and the mouth. We came up with these distance ratios presumed to be rather uh, stable regardless of the distance at which we are imaging somebody. That's a statement that's not quite true, but that was the point. If that is true, if my friend is remembering this, the CIA's um, approach from the 1980s correctly, it would indicate that the CIA was doing something that wasn't nearly as sophisticated as what, as what Woodrow W. Bledsoe was doing. Bledsoe, again, had these two spheres that he rotated into each other. That's a much uh, more sophisticated approach 
than what the CIA was using. In this paper, the CIA says that by 1992, they had turned over their automated facial recognition system to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and they were using it uh, uh, with the Border Patrol. All right. So now the question becomes, can we automate that process of finding anchor points? A very nice PhD thesis was done at Stanford University in 1970, and it was funded by the Defense Department's Advanced Research Project Agency. And in this, uh, Michael Kelly was attempting to automatically find some of the anchor points on the face. The way he did that was he took a picture of a background and then put a person in front of the background and did simply background subtraction so he could find the edges of the skull. Then he had the photograph digitized. Now you know a little bit something I think about digitized photograph. You know that there are these picture elements called pixels and there are a whole bunch of them across the photograph and the pixels go generally from a numerical value of zero, meaning black, to 255, meaning white. So if Kelly had a digitized photograph and he looked across the rows like this, he could see mid-level gray in a black and white photograph of the face, 100, 100, 100, and then suddenly the values went up very high because of the white of the eye, and then came down very, very low because of the pupil of the eye, and then went back up very, very high because of the white of the eye, and then stabilized about at the reflectivity of the face, let's make it 100, right? And not only that, you should get a repeating of that pro process across multiple successive rows of the image. So if he saw these values along at 100 and then spiking to white, then going down to black, then spiking again to white, and then going back to 100, and he saw the same pattern in several rows, he says, I found the eyes. And that's exactly what he did. Um, he did a little work on finding the mouths. Uh, the full uh, paper is not available online, but the abstract is at the Defense Technical Information Center, uh, which I've put up there, and you can verify from his abstract what he did. Uh, the next thing that's most interesting is the work of Professor Takeo Kanade, Takeo Kanade is one of our great saints in the area of computer vision. He's a professor emeritus now at Carnegie Mellon University. He's a fascinating character, and every time he gives a lecture like this, the, the halls are absolutely packed, everyone wanting to hear him. He did a very interesting demonstration at the Osaka World's Expo in 1970. And in that exposition, he had his setup, uh, his demonstration, and it said, is your face more like that of John Kennedy, John Wayne, or Marilyn Monroe? Stand in front of the camera and we'll find out. He would find the eyes, and then he would find the mouth, and he'd find the ratio of the eyes to the mouth, and then he'd give you your answer. I spoke to Professor Kanade a few years ago about this. He says, Jim, Jim, it was the perfect experiment. Number one, there is no ground truth, and number two, everybody goes away happy. <laughs> yes, I have a Marilyn Monroe type face. He said, but doing a post-mortem, that is going back and looking at the images and how they were handled by the algorithm after all of this happened, we were finding eyes up here and mouths down here and who knew. But he, his PhD thesis has been published as a book in 1977 and the full book is downloadable online. You can find it right there and, and there's the uh, URL to it. Now. When we hit the 1980s, something very, very important happened. Um, suddenly, we had the ability to digitize signals. Now, Kelly in uh, Stanford had the ability to digitize photo images. I was at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We were a poor campus then. And in the 70s, I didn't know any way to digitize an image. There may have been somewhere, some place on campus that was doing that. It certainly didn't involve any of the engineering department that I uh, uh, interfaced with, but by 1980, real cheap technology came out that allowed us to digitize images and digitize signals of all kinds, and this whole area of digital signal processing just took off like crazy. I got sucked into it. Everybody that had any numerical capabilities at all was sucked into digital signal processing in the 1980s. I was working at that time trying to do speaker recognition 
using something that's called principal component analysis. Now, I would love, honest to goodness, to stand up here for the next hour and a half discussing principal component analysis with you. It is not a difficult concept to understand. It's just time consuming, right? So I can't really tell you, and it bothers me, because it's so beautiful, it's beautiful, beautiful mathematical theory. It's not hard to understand. It bothers me, I can't tell you about it. I'm just gonna wave my hands over it and tell you a little bit about how that works. Now, it turns out that I didn't get very far using principal component analysis with speaker recognition, but there were some people that got really far doing it with face recognition. Surovich and Kirby were at Brown University. Um, they were funded by the National Science Foundation and they came up with what they called um, eigenpictures. Uh, the words eigenvalues and eigenfaces are buzzwords that come out of this principal component analysis. Um, their work was not nearly as well uh, publicized as the work of Matthew Turk and Alex Pentland a couple years later who were at MIT Lincoln Lab and code, uh, 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 came up with the word uh, eigenfaces um, and published this paper, Eigenfaces for Recognition. Uh, this paper was far better known than Surovich and Kirby's paper, but Surovich and Kirby, in fact, were first. And then a couple years after that, uh, Joseph Attic, who was a very young professor at Rockefeller University, uh, had a student of his, Paneo Penev, and they came up with something that was quite similar in its approach, um, and I will classify that as the same form, generally, of facial recognition. I'm gonna explain that here in a minute. Uh, important to note that Turk and Pentland's work was funded by Arbitron. They were a uh, competitor to the Nielsen rating for television. I spoke to Matthew Turk about this recently. He's now an engineering professor at UC Santa Barbara, my alma mater. And um, he said he, he doesn't really know why Arbitron was so interested in the work and willing to fund it. But um, Joseph Attic's work was funded by the Office of Naval Research. So let's talk a little bit about general image processing and how this works. Now remember, I told you that a image, if it's in black and white, consists of a series of pixels, and pixels are integers or whole numbers that go from zero to 255, right? So I've written a little cartoon over here of my image. Um, and I've kept my whole numbers, my integers, kind of small because it's easier for me to deal with to have numbers that go one, two, five, three, as opposed to going from zero to 255. All right, so our images are black and white. We have integer pixel values from zero to 255. When I did this kind of work, I always subtracted 127 from them, so I'd go from a number, negative 127 to 128. It's a little bit, my background is, is in classical math, and it's a little bit more, uh, it feels better to a classical mathematician to have the average value or the middle value run around zero as opposed to have what we call a, a bias in the value. And the images that were being used back then in the 1980s were about 128 by 64 pixels. Now we generally use something closer to 250 times 300 pixels, and there were generally 28 pixels between the eye centers. And now we have far more than that, maybe 69 in one of the studies I'll show you, maybe 90 for your uh, passport image. Okay, now that is what nature gives me. That's the photograph. Right? Those are the zeros and ones that are your face or my face or his face or her face. The filter is something entirely different. I am the algorithm developer. And I wanna make a big deal out of this. This is how it used to be. The algorithm developer gets to pick the filter. I get to say what the filter is going to be. And I pick the filter here where the first column is negative one, the second column is zero, and the third column is positive one. Right? Again, whole numbers. And here's what I'm going to do on my next slide here. It's kind of a cartoon. I'm gonna take my filter and I'm going to put it on top of my image. And wherever there's a collision, I'm gonna do a multiplication. And then I'm gonna add the whole thing up, add up all of those nine products, right? Do you see what I've done there? So I've put these negative ones over the first column of the image, right there's the first column of the image, I put negative ones. So when I multiply it now, the, it comes out negative one, negative two, one. Then I put a column of zeros over the first, second column here, a column of one there over there, and then I add all those things up, and you can do it, I think, in your head, and find that my solution is one, right? And that's digital image filtering. That's what happens, fairly easy. Computers love to do integer multiply and adds. They absolutely love that. Integers love to multiply, they love to add, they love to subtract, ah, division, not so much. Just like you, right? And one of the reasons is if you multiply 
two integers together and you add integers together, you always get an integer. You always get a whole number, right? But if you divide integers, it's not always true. I think we can all multiply, say, 3 by 8 in our head and get 24. Remember how that works? But try dividing 3 by 8. Some of you may have memorized that, but it's a harder, much harder problem. So don't ask the computer to divide if you don't have to. Right, that's the rule. So the computer loves to do this type of image processing. All right, so now we're going to go back to that eigenface thing, and I'm going to try to explain how this all works. We're going to go into our laboratory, and I'm going to take a whole bunch of photos of people maybe in my laboratory in this particular case, and I'm going to jam all those photos together, and I'm going to start pulling out these basic faces from these jammed together photos. Now, if you happen to be a mathematician, and I'm sure that some of you are, you've seen I've done a little play on words here. I'm calling these basic faces, where maybe a mathematician would call them basis faces, and these square blocks of numbers can be unraveled to make a long vector. So these numbers, a mathematician would tell you, become a basis vector. But we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to say that these faces are pulled out of the conglomeration of all the faces I've got in the lab. And these faces represent either pictures or numbers. Can you make the transition in your head? Any place you see pure black, Think of zero. Any place you see pure white, think of 255. And then anything in between, think of some number in between. And now I'm going to take each one of those faces in turn, the block of numbers, and place it on that block of numbers and do all the multiply adds. I'm going to get this number right here. Now, notice I've scaled it. Otherwise, it'd be a very, very large integer, 46,000. But I'm going to divide all of these here by a scaling number, and I'll explain why that is in a minute. Okay, so here's what we've got. When I put this block of numbers on that block of numbers, do all the multiply adds and then divide at the end by a scaling constant, I'm going to get 0.46. What is 0.46? That's a facial feature. Huh? Yeah. That's a facial feature. That's the first facial feature. Here's a second facial feature. Here's a third facial feature. Here's a fourth facial feature. These are global features because every pixel on my face contributed to that number, right? If I smile, that number changes, and that number changes, and that number changes, and that number changes. Huh. Well, this doesn't sound like it's going to be very good and very stable, but actually it worked. It worked so well that the Army Research Lab said, holy mackerel, about 1992, we can start testing these technologies. There's something here to test. These things might actually work. Now, let me give you another interpretation of this. And again, for the mathematicians, it has to do with the fact that all of these are orthogonal basis vectors when unwrapped. <laughs> Here's the wonderful part. Now, a different way of explaining this. If I take 0.46 of that image, subtract 0.13 of that image, add in 0.11 of that image, subtract 0.08 of that image, I get a very nice approximation to this face. But here's a caveat. Provided that this face was well represented by the faces that went into this group of faces that I mashed together to get those various eigenfaces. Now, I, got, I happened to get these faces from a buddy of mine at Colorado State University. I got them from them about maybe 15 years ago. They look to me very masculine, and they look to me very young. And I'm going to guess that they came from photos of his laboratory students that were mashed together to create these faces, right? I don't know. Maybe they don't look masculine and young to you, but they look masculine and young to me. So what I'm trying to say is that this face here will only be well represented by this much of that face, this much of that face, this much of that face, to the extent that this is a young male face. So already we're starting to see what becomes racial bias in our algorithms. If the races were not balanced going into our basic faces, it's going to be very, very hard to portray, say, a, a aging Asian woman using faces that came out of young Caucasian males, for example, right? But on the other hand, there's, <laughs> it's not necessarily bad. If what we're trying to do is differentiate between young Caucasian males, we can do no better than to have 
the basic faces represent young Caucasian males. And then the older, aging Caucasian males kind of all lump in together. They all look alike. But by golly, these younger Caucasian males can be very, very adequately distinguished and differentiated by an approach that focuses on them. So there's a good side and a downside to the bias thing, right? We can tune our algorithm to just the group that we want to be able to differentiate and figure those people outside of the group, we're, we just can't differentiate between them. They're all, all going to, all, all aging Caucasian males are going to look, look alike to us. Okay. Well, the problem with this, of course, is our global features, and that's where uh, Penev and Attic's work from Rockefeller University was slightly different. They said, well, what we want to do is instead of having these basic faces, we're going to come up with some basic patterns here that only have non-zero values in very localized areas. So that we, for the first face, we'll only have non-zero values, say, around the mouth. So that any changes in the eyes won't change that first global feature. And then the second one will only have non-zero values, say, around the right eye, so that changes in the mouth will not change that feature, et cetera. And it turns out that Penn of an Attic then, starting about 1994, did extraordinarily well in the ARL tests, the second round of tests uh, that were held by the Army Research Laboratory. OK. Now, by the end of the 1990s, ARPA, Advanced Research Project Agency of the Department of Defense, and the Army Research Laboratories were funding Christoph von der Marlsberg. And he was up at the University of Southern California. He had a simultaneous appointment at the University of Bochum in Germany. And they were funding him to take an entirely different approach to facial recognition called elastic bunch graph matching. This elastic bunch graph matching has been so successful that it continues to this day in our existing, many of our existing algorithms, many of our existing um, uh, fielded systems. So let me try to explain this. And these, again, are cartoons. All right, this is a cartoon here that is supposed to represent numbers going up and down. These are our filters. So here's what we've got. We've got a block of numbers. Around the outside, they're going to be zeros. So the only non-zero parts are going to be a circle in the middle. And this is a cartoon that says the numbers are going to go up, and then the numbers are going to go down. And then the numbers are going to go up, and the numbers are going to go down. Do you see that, the, get a meaning here for the cartoon? If I were to show you the numbers, it would just be kind of crazy and confusing. But by drawing a cartoon, I think I can show you that we've got numbers going up and down in that direction, numbers going up and down in that direction. We've got 12 of these filters. Here the, at the bottom, the filters are very, very small, and numbers go up and down real fast. At the top, the filters are much bigger, and the numbers go up and down much slower. We're going to take those 12 numbers and place them on, a, on the intersections of a grid. The grid of, is placed on a face. So got a face, put a grid on the face, and at each intersection of the grid, we're going to place these 12 filters and get a number out. We're going to get a single, we call this a scalar. We're going to get a single whole number out, right? So at each of these 12 intersections, we're going to have 12 numbers. We're going to have a total of 144 numbers that represents that face. OK, fair enough. So here's a face. Got the 144 numbers. OK, here's another face from the same person. Got 144 numbers. Now, do the first 144 numbers seem to match up with the second 144 numbers? Uh, not exactly. Why? My pose angle is a little different. My expression is a little different. So what we do is we warp the grid. Well, wait a minute, those numbers don't line up, but what if I warp the grid a little bit and recompute? Maybe by warping the grid just right, I can get the numbers to match. Now, you should be saying, well, wait a minute, that's cheating. Anybody's face can be warped into anybody else's face. How would we know? We penalize the system for the amount of warp. If we have to warp too much, we say, ah, that can't be the same face, right? Very, very successful. And let me point out that there is a finite size to these filters, we're not looking to, to, to place them over any particular patch or point on the face. We're placing the filters over a general mouth area. So this, then, was the big breakthrough that von der Marlsberg made. He said, well, wait a minute. We can find the eyes, right? We know how to find the eyes. Kelly taught us how to do that. We can find eyes. And probably eyes are more distinctive than cheeks. So what if I tried to hang my filters on the eyes 
and then figure underneath the eyes and down someplace there's going to be a nose, and that noses are probably pretty distinctive too. And underneath the nose and down a ways, there's probably going to be a mouth, and mouths are probably pretty distinctive too. I don't have to know exactly where the nose is or exactly where the mouth is because I've got these filters that, yeah, it'll cover it, right? And then we do the warping thing with the various filters placed on areas of the face that we think are highly distinctive, and boy, by golly, this really, really worked and has been uh, the core to most of our fielded algorithms to this day. I'm going to be a little bit careful because we're going now in a slightly different direction, and, and I don't know how rapidly we are able to move some of the newer algorithms into our systems. Uh, it, it takes some time, as you can imagine. So to, do, to explain where we are today, I've got to talk a little bit about convolution filters. So the big grid here represents those numbers that form a face, right? I, I haven't put any numbers there. I, it's a cartoon again. Imagine that in each one of those little squares a number sits. The numbers go from zero black to 255 white, and they represent a face. I'm going to take a filter, and I'm going to put it down here. And whatever value I get from that filter, I'm going to write it down over here. Um, Right? So whatever value comes out of these, this 3x3 three three filter placed on this part of the image, I'm going to put it there. And then I'm going to slide this along one more spot, and I'm going to put this filter down on this part of the image, I'm going to put that number there. You see that I can slide this all the way down and all the way up and get a whole other block of numbers. There's some other things I can do if I want to make this block of numbers smaller. Imagine that I move this, instead of one pixel each time, I move it over two pixels, I'd have half as many pixels on that size. So I can start with a big image and go to a small image if I want. I can start with a big image and stay with a big image if I want. These are called convolution filters. And this forms the backbone of the most modern algorithms that we're developing today. In fact, these modern algorithms are known as uh, artificial intelligence approaches. And they started maybe about 2014. So they're really maybe only about five years old. I'm showing you a car cartoon here from a paper published in uh, 2015 by Google. Um, this doesn't mean that Google is actually using this approach, but it does mean that Google is studying this approach. And so here's what we've got. We've got a face. The face has filters put on it, these convolution filters put on it, and we get a new block of images. But there can be multiple filters and multiple convolutions, such that if I start with a single face, I pull a filter all over the face, I get a new block of numbers. Take another filter, pull it all over the face, get a new block of numbers. This cartoon is supposed to represent the fact that I've taken multiple filters and drug it across this face, and I've gotten multiple images then that I've stacked. I hope this is fairly understandable, right? Okay. And if I want, I can reduce the size of the images, as we talked about. And then in the end, I can unwrap everything if I want and get a vector. So this particular approach that uh, uh, Google is talking about is called the Siamese network, because here's what they do. The algorithm developer does not decide what the filter is. Remember I said the algorithm developer gets to decide the filter? Not at all. Here we allow the computer to decide what the filter is going to be. Huh, how is that going to work? Well, here's how it works. We're going to take, picture, take images of faces uh, in triplets. We're going to have two images of the same face and one image of a different face. And we're going to put it in the system and start adjusting the numbers in these filters until we get something that says, yep, high value for the two same faces, low value for the face, and a different face, right? But we're not going to train it on just one triple of images. We're going to train it on, say, 10,000 or 100,000 triples of images until we've got these filters all adjusted so that any triple of images we put in gives us the right answer. It says, yep, those two are the same face, but nope, these two are not the same face. We allow the computer to pick for us what filters are going to go into this system that work to give us the answers we need. So, Part of what's happening is people in my generation are starting to feel a little bit put out because no longer do we decide the algorithms, do we decide the filters, the computer's going to decide the filters. So my friends have been giving me a lot of uh, uh, interesting things to tell you. One of them said, uh, well, tell them this is deep learning. It's not deep understanding. We have no idea what the filters do or mean. We don't even know what they are. 
Another friend of mine says, no, no, Jim, this is machine learning. The machines get really, really smart. The people stay stupid. We have no idea what these filters mean or why they mean, if, why they are what they are. I mean, we can break apart the algorithm and we can see what numbers the computer finally came up with for the filters, but what does that mean and why? We have absolutely no idea at all. So here is another paper that was published in 2004 by the people from Facebook. Um, I, I'm supposed to know this uh, starlet here, and, and I want to make sure that I explain. You see all that grid stuff there? That's not for recognizing that face. It's only for warping the face around so that we get a pose angle straight on. And, and often in magazines and newspaper articles about face recognition, I see these grids placed on faces as though that's how we're going to recognize the face. Not true at all. If a grid goes on a face, it's entirely for pulling the darn thing around as much as we can so that we have a full-on image. All right, and what Facebook does is real interesting. They don't take a black and white image. They take a red, blue, a green image. They take the color image, and they process each one of those color images independently. So here, if you can read back there, it says 32 by 13, I'm sorry, 32 by 11 by 11 by 3. The 3 are the red, green, blue images. The 11 by the 11 is the size of this filter that I'm going to drag across the image, and 32 is the number of filters that I have that I'm dragging across the image, right? So I get this big block of matrices, right? I get a matrix for every one of the three images for every one of the 32 filters, right? Okay. On the second level, they reduce the size of this to a 32 by 3 by 3 by 32, all the way down to finally at the end, they unwrap this thing and they have a vector, and that vector corresponds in some way to this face here, all right? Now, if anybody were to say to you, well, here's how facial recognition works. We're going to find the distance between the eyes and the nose, the corners of the mouth, and the distance to the corner of the mouth. If you were to read something like that, say in a federal court finding, you would say, well, I don't see how that would be true at all. What part of all of this finds the distance between the eyes and the distance from the eye to the nose? And No, 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 no. no. That's what we did back in the 60s. That's what we were trying to do with Takeo Kanadi's work in 1970. We, we haven't done that for a long, long time. We're not looking at the distance between the eyes and the nose and any of that stuff. We're, we're doing something here, and we're not even sure what it is that we're doing. We're just grinding and grinding and crunching and crunching and hoping at the end we come up with the right numbers. But what's really amazing is actually this works. Works pretty darn good. And so it's putting people like me, those that are classically trained in mathematics, out of work. We just have to set up the architecture, and we have to run this thing over tens of thousands of these triplets, these two images match, these two images don't, until the computer says, yeah, I'm pretty set now. I think I've got a set of filters that works pretty well. We don't know what the filters mean, but those are our answers. Now, these new algorithms lead to new problems. We don't know how the algorithms work. So this is a paper that was done at Carnegie Mellon. Real interesting. They had access, of course, to the algorithms, and so they made these funny glasses. And they tuned the funny glasses so that they gave a, funny, a set of funny glasses to this guy, and the computer thought he was this person. <laughs> they have a different set of funny glasses they give to this lady, and that computer thinks this lady is that person, and a different set of funny glasses they tune so that this guy looks like that person mm -hmm. there. Right? We don't know all the failure modes for these AI-motivated facial recognition algorithms. We're just beginning to understand how they might fail. We, we, we don't know what they're doing, so we don't know how they fail. OK. So the next thing I want to tackle is now that we know kind of how they work, and I'm saying kind of because I, I don't really understand much of how they work other than we set up an architecture and let the thing work and work and work until those matrices and vectors stabilize. How well do these systems work? Very influential paper was published by my friend uh, Jonathan Phillips. Uh, in 2000. Uh, he's a researcher at NIST. He was responsible for the original ARL, Army Research Lab, testing in the 1990s. He said there's three types of tests with generally increasing error rates, technology tests, scenario tests, operational tests. These are my words up here. I describe them this way. In a technology test, we test the algorithms with curated data. We take a data set of faces, and by curated, I mean we've removed all of the images for which there is no face. We've removed all of the images that are really, really blurred. 
We've removed all of the images that don't meet the criteria of the curator as to, yeah, that's an image I can use. Very, very controlled test. And we're going to run an algorithm then against these curated images. And a scenario test, what we do is get a bunch of people like you. I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to volunteer one at, one at a time, and I'd like you to come in here as though you were boarding an airplane, and we're going to take your picture. That's a scenario test. And now we're testing the devices with a human-machine interface, right? And last of all, we do operational testing. And operational testing, this is my little joke, but it's too true. We're testing systems with Bob behavior. We put one of these systems in at an airport and see what happens. We don't really know what happens. We don't know who's really coming forward. And very few of these operational tests are actually published. I have done several, and I don't think I've gotten permission to publish any of them, really. Yeah, I published one for the Immigration and Naturalization Service back in the 90s. But the reason they don't get published is because if it's an operational test, usually it involves a security system of some type. And the managers say, no, no, we don't want you releasing any information about how well our system does or doesn't work. And so operational tests, there's a standard for uh, how you might conduct an operational test, but operational tests are rarely published. I am going to show you one from the German government. The Germans have done a very, very good job in publishing uh, operational results from their uh, border crossing system. Okay. One of the things we focus on in operational tests is error rates. There are two types of error rates. There's a false non-match rate. That is the percentage of mated transactions. This face and this face are from the same person. It's a mated transaction. The percentage in which the answer comes out wrong. Oh, no, I don't think they're the same person, right? That's a false non-match rate. Then we have a false match rate. We have this face and this face that are really two different people. Our ground truth tells us that. And the computer says, oh, yeah, that's the same person, right? All right, so there's two types of error rates depending on whether ground truth says these are the same face or ground truth says these are different face. We do not have a definition of accuracy. So we do have, incidentally, an international vocabulary standard, and the standard is freely downloadable. You can download it from there. And you'll go through that standard. There's a, about 160, 170 words in the standard. You will not find the word accuracy defined. We don't know what accuracy means. So it's interesting that a number of federal government agencies in the United States have published some accuracy figures for their face recognition. They say 97% accuracy. Since there's no definition for accuracy, it can mean anything they want, I guess. I have no idea what they mean when they say 97% accuracy. I complain about this all the time, but it's usually somebody out of a public relations group, you know, the, the, the uh, press office that's published this stuff, and I have no idea where they get the numbers. The other thing that's interesting is percent match probability. There's a big debate going on right now in the internet one group says it's an 80% match probability. Another group says it's a 90% match probability. This is crazy. There's no such thing as a match probability. I would love, and I have given complete two-hour lectures on this particular problem of a match probability. It's something we call an inverse conditional probability if you're a mathematician, right? If I know these things are mated, I can give you the distribution of their scores, their comparison scores. But if I give you a comparison score, I can't give you any distribution for whether or not they're mated. They either are mated or they're not mated, right? The probability that they are or are not mated is what's called a subjective probability. The probability, knowing that they are mated of a certain distribution of scores, is something called an empirical probability. And scientists have been arguing these issues now for about 120 years, and we don't have time to argue this out today, other than to say, if you hear someone say there's an 80% match probability, you know they don't know what they're talking about. It's no such thing. It's not defined. If somebody made a subjective judgment, I'm about 80% sure that those two things match. Purely subjective. The computer can't tell you that. There's no way a computer can tell you any of that stuff. Okay. And there's a big debate going on right now that kind of drives me crazy. Two groups arguing over whether it should be an 80% match probability or 90% match probability. No such thing anyway. Okay. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. They were formerly the National Bureau of Standards. They changed their name about 1982. They conduct three or four tests per year of facial recognition technologies. And you can download those tests. Here's, here's the latest one. The latest one was published in, uh, the date on that is October 16th. So the latest one was published less than two months ago, right? And every one of these colored lines represents a different algorithm that was submitted to them either by a university group or by a commercial company 
or by somebody, right? Now, the important thing to see here really are these scales along here and to note the kind of image that's being used. What's being used here is a visa image. You'll notice that it's a full face. It's taken straight on, right? We've experimented a little bit with taking images from off angles. The worst angle you can take an image from is from above. You're taking an image from above, you can't recognize anything. You see the top of somebody's head, right? Okay, so these are very, very carefully taken visa images. They're straight on. They're a plain background. There's nothing crazy going on in the background. There's only one person in the image. The person is looking straight on. And what's important then to us is to note the scales here. This is a linear scale of the false non-match rate, the false negative rate. They really are from the same person, but it looks like they're not. And this is a logarithmic scale of the false positive rate. They're really not from the same person, but the machine says they are. Look at this. We could get up here to 1% false negative, and down here we're running 1 in 10 to the seventh, 1 in 10 million false positives. That means that we could pick out about 99% of the people looking right like that and only make a mistake about every 10 million comparisons. That's absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. But let me change the data a little bit. Same test that was run by NIST, same report. There's a report. You can download it and see it for yourself. Although, I have to warn you, it's 684 pages. <laughs> now look what we've done. We don't have, the scale has changed. And now we're not doing front-on images, and we've got a confused background, right? But again, these are curated images. If the background's too crazy or there's no face in it, we pull the image out, right? So here's what we've got. Look at the scale here. Now, this is 3 or 4%. And this is not 10 to the 7th, it's 10 to the 6th. This is 1 in a million. And look what happens here. To get down from, say, 3.8% down to 3%, we've got to give up two orders of magnitude of the false positive rate. In other words, some of these faces are just so bad we just can't recognize them, right? There's no way we can recognize them until we get down here in, in making a mistake of one in 10. We get down to the point that you look like one in every 10 people, we can pretty much get this now below a 1% false negative rate. Okay, so those are technology tests. They're just published by NIST in the last two months. Let's move on to a test that was published two months ago, I'm sorry, two years ago by NIST. 2017. It was funded by the Department of Homeland Security, so it's a scenario test. It could have been reported the same way the last test was, but it wasn't because the Department of Homeland Security had something in mind. They wanted to know if we could set up a camera on a jet bridge and have people getting off of the plane correctly recognized as they got off the plane, right? Um, I, I'm sorry that the, the wording on this is so... Um, uh, arcane. Let me try to explain it. So this is directly from the report. This report is from 2017, again from NIST. It says, the most al accurate algorithm correctly identified all but 6% of 354 subjects when searching a gallery of 480 individuals. This is achieved with the aid of an attractor to induce frontal view and a bottleneck to force a delay when the threshold is allowed to set, set to allow 10 false positives. Let me try to explain this. You got an airplane with 480 people on it. 354 of those people get off the airplane. All but 20 of those people are correctly recognized. Yep, but 20 of the people aren't correctly recognized. 10 of those people are recognized as somebody else, and 10 of those people aren't recognized as anybody at all. And that is under a condition where we have a choke point, so we slow everybody down, right? So they have to go through one at a time and we put a flashing light on the camera so they have to look at the camera. And keep in mind, the camera is placed at head height. That's pretty miserable. You unload a plane of 480 people, you don't get them all unloaded, and already you've got 10 people you think are somebody else. All right, tremendous bookkeeping problem. This is one of the reasons you will not see, and, and <laughs> don't tell the companies this. They're out there advertising seamless airplane boarding where you're not going to have to show a passport, you're not going to have to show a, uh, a boarding pass, you're just going to walk straight on the airplane, the airplane's going to say, yep, Bob Jones, um, Marilyn um, Smith, we know exactly who you are. That's not going to happen. 
And one of the reasons it's not going to happen is because we have no way of knowing what happens when Marilyn Smith goes to get on the plane. They say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, we just saw you get on the plane, right? Or we just saw you get off the plane. Who was that other person? And Marilyn says, I, I, I have no idea who that other person was. Why are you asking me? I'm just getting on the plane. You go to that other person. If you do find the other person, and what are you going to say to them? Oh, we misidentified you. We thought you were Marilyn Smith. That's not my problem. You know, I'm, I'm not responsible for that. You know, don't ask me to come back and scan in again. So these systems that are being promoted now in the press as seamless border crossing systems simply haven't been, we haven't found a way to make them work because we haven't found a way to, to deal with the false positives. False negatives is fine. If we don't recognize you as anybody, we can pull you aside. And I told you that manual adjudication is always possible if there's a prejudicial outcome. If you get off the plane, we don't recognize you and say, sir, could you come over here for a minute? We've got to find out who you are because our system didn't recognize you. Okay, fair enough. But we can't deal with the false positives. This is the data I promised you from the German border crossing system. The Germans have been very, very good about publishing and presenting to us uh, the operational results from their automated border crossing system. How does the system work? You take your passport, you put it on the machine. The machine reads the image off your passport. You look straight at the camera, and it tries to compare you to the image that it just pulled off the passport. And here's what they say. They say that this is about... Uh, about uh, 2%, 3%, 4%. They say, we can recognize all but about 4% of the people presenting their passports. About 4% of the people we can't recognize. And further, our false positive rate is only one in 1,000. Meaning, if you were to pick up a passport at random and put it down there, there's only a chance of one in 1,000 that your face would match that randomly picked up passport. OK, so as these people get off the plane, about 4% of them are not recognized. What do we do? Well, we just pull them aside and we say, show us your passport, right? Systems like this are now actively working in places like New Zealand, Australia, UK, Germany. Um, the only one that I know of that's open to US passport holders is Australia. If you go into Australia, you can opt into an incoming system. And I suggest that you do that. You go to a kiosk, you put your, your passport down, they give you a little slip of paper. But leaving Australia, um, it's an opt-out system. Unless you know you can opt out, you probably won't opt out. So if you leave Australia, you will be using one of these automated systems where you put your passport down in the system, you look at the camera, and if it recognizes your face as being that on the passport, the gate opens. If it doesn't recognize you, you simply get in the primary line with everybody else or the people that aren't eligible to use the system. All right. Um, so thank you to the Germans for showing us that bit of operational information. So now we have to ask the question, is automatic facial recognition racially biased? You've read an awful lot about this. Um, recent results published in the last month or so, September of this month, by my friends Kevin Boyer and Mike King, looked at two algorithms. They found, now in this case, this direction is good, this direction is bad, and here they have African Americans worse in performance than Caucasians. But in this algorithm, the African Americans perform better than the Caucasians, right? So looking at these two algorithms, we can't say that facial recognition in general is better for one racial group than another. Now, NIST came out in September with this report right here that differentiates either farther, even farther. I might say that NIST is on the hook to present a report to Congress by December 24th of this year on racial bias and facial recognition algorithms. What NIST has done here is they break out African-American women, African-American men, Afri uh, Caucasian men and Caucasian women into four groups. In this particular case, this direction is good, that direction is bad. And one of the things you find is with all four of these different algorithms, it's the African American women for whom the algorithm performs best, right? And uh, women, Caucasian women, the algorithm performs better down here at this very low false positive rate, but doesn't perform so well up here at this higher false positive rate, it's a very, very complicated scenario. And what these gray lines across there mean, it's been even harder to describe, it's that if we were to set a single threshold, the threshold is going to treat these groups differently. It may be entirely possible to set a threshold that gives us the correct percentage of false negative errors for one group and then it gives a higher percentage of false negative errors to the other group, even though the system in general works better for the second group. I know that's a complicated concept to explain, but what it means is that 
These algorithms may have some racial and gender differences to them, but it's not clear that they act in the direction of bias, except when we go and set a threshold and say, oh, anybody whose facial recognition score meets this threshold can go. Anyone who doesn't has to come back, and we have to examine their passport uh, individually. That, may, that threshold setting may lead to some uh, disparate treatment across racial and gender groups. All right. You may not know about these Supreme Court decisions. Um, dating back to 1910, none of these decisions had anything to do with facial recognition. That's an important point to make, right? But in all of the decisions, facial recognition was taken as emblematic of something that we know goes on and you have no right of privacy over. Let's take the case of Holt versus United States, 1910. Holt uh, was, uh, uh, there was a murder and someone was hit with a pipe and there was a bloody shirt that was found at the scene of the crime, they called it a blouse. And so Holt was asked in front of the jury, please put on this shirt. He put on the shirt, the shirt fit, the jury convicted him, he appealed. He said, I've got a Fifth Amendment right not to self-incriminate myself, and, and when you asked me to put the shirt on in front of the jury, I was incriminated, right? Here's what the Supreme Court said. The objection in principle would forbid a jury to look at a prisoner and compare his features with a photograph and proof. Case had nothing to do with facial images, but the Supreme Court used that as an example. What? You don't expect juries to look at your face? Schmerber versus California was a case where a person had his blood taken after a tra traffic accident against his will to test for alcohol in his blood. And the US Supreme Court said both federal and state courts have usually held the Fifth Amendment offers no protection, protection against compulsion to submit to and then listed a whole bunch of things, including ph photographing. Supreme Court holds, you have, you have no right to claim that taking a photograph of you and comparing a photograph violates your Fifth Amendment rights. United States versus Dionisio. Dionisio was asked to give a voice exemplar to a grand jury. He objected. Here's what the Supreme Court said. No person can have a reasonable expectation that others will not know the sound of his voice any more than he can have a reasonable expectation that his face will be a mystery to the world. And lastly, this case of Maryland versus King had to do with DNA analysis. Uh, Mr. King was involved in some burglaries because the state of Maryland allows DNA to be taken from uh, uh, suspects in uh, felony, uh, uh, felony crimes. They took his DNA and were able to match his DNA against an unsolved rape. He was convicted of the unsolved rape. He said, wait a minute, you took my DNA from a burglary and now you're convicting me for an unsolved rape. That's entirely unfair. The U.S. Supreme Court said the use of DNA for identification is no different than matching an arrestee's face to a wanted poster of a previously unidentified subject. In other words, the Supreme Court has said over and over and over again, you have no right to privacy, you have no right against self-incrimination when we talk about taking a photograph of you and comparing it either to you or to other photographs of yourself. That's very, very interesting. Now this is even more interesting, and it may not have come to your attention, these are lower court rulings from the Virginia uh, Circuit Court from October of 2014, and there's a more recent, uh, this uh, 2019 from United States District Court of Northern California, are very, very interesting cases. The first one, this fellow Baust uh, had a cell phone, and the police said, we need you to put your fingerprint on here to unlock your cell phone. And he said, I don't want to do it. They said, you have to do it. So he put his fingerprint down and unlocked the cell phone. He claimed that's self-incrimination. Virginia court ruled this way. They said, no, a fingerprint is non-testimonial, and based on everything that we have seen in the previous Supreme Court decisions, you have no Fifth Amendment rights against giving any biometric measure, your fingerprint, your face, or whatever, right? But you do not have to state testimonially your PIN. So if your cell phone is protected by a pin, the government can't ask you to give testimony against yourself as to what the cell phone pin is, but they can ask you to put your fingerprint down and open up your cell phone. Isn't that interesting? Now, the second, and, and you can look these up, they're all online, the second here is a little bit more subtle than that. It was a Northern District of, of uh, a Federal Circuit Court in Northern District of California. It was just last August, I think, and they said um, that um, you can't use this technique to determine whether or not the cell phone belongs to someone. But if you, it's a foregone conclusion, was the legal s statement they made. If it's a foregone conclusion that the cell phone belongs to me, 
then the law enforcement can ask me to put my thumb down and open the cell phone, right? And they can do that without a warrant. All right, interesting stuff. Now, I told you we'd be talking about creepy. This is a really interesting paper that was published in 2013. It's freely downloadable from the internet. It's called The Theory of Creepy, Technology, Privacy, and Shifting Social Norms. Now, everything we've done to this point, you may say, well, yeah, it may be legally permissible for the government to take a picture of my face, but it still feels kind of creepy, doesn't it? And Tene and Polonetsky would say yes. In certain cases, creepy behavior pushes against traditional social norms. You and I have this social agreement that I will not be inspecting your face. If, if we talk, and I hope we have plenty of time to talk after this lecture, if we talk, um, I'll be looking you in the eyes and you'll be looking me in the eyes. We won't be inspecting each other's face, right? And you won't be making comments about my face. You won't say, geez, what, what's, what's going on there on your cheek, right? That, that'd be kind of creepy, wouldn't it? But yet, that's what the machine's doing. The machine is inspecting our face. That, in other words, we're violating in a technology a social norm that we hold to be dear. And I think for a lot of people, they say, well, gee, it may be legal to take my face image and to inspect my face, but it still feels creepy. And I have to agree with them. Still feels kind of creepy, doesn't it? Okay. Now, there's plenty of legislation limiting facial recognition applications. The most recent was just proposed here on the 14th of November. It's a bipartisan uh, proposal by Democratic Senator Chris Coons and Republican Senator Mike Lee. It's called a Proposed Federal Legislation Facial Recognition Technology Warrant Act. They say Congress should establish appropriate rail guards, and you can download from uh, Senator Coons' website his proposed legislation. The one that's been getting the most um, interest lately is this 2008 act in Illinois called the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which says that you have to have a written statement from me before you are allowed to do any biometric comparisons using my data, if you're in the state of Illinois. And if you violate that, I have the right to uh, civil damages. So now every lawyer in the country is trying to get civil damages against every biometric provider, facial recognition or otherwise. There's a uh, pending suit, it's already gone through part of the court system, called Patel versus Facebook over precisely that. Um, uh, Patel is claiming that Facebook was matching his face without written permission. Facebook claimed, yeah, but we're not doing it in Illinois. And the court came back and said, we don't care where you're doing it, Patel lives in Illinois. And regardless of where this computer cloud resides, Facebook cannot, according to this law then, um, match faces against a resident of Illinois and cannot use the uh, statement. Well, uh, the matching didn't go on in Illinois. San Francisco banned all government use of facial recognition. California bans facial recognition on police body cams. I don't know of any, any police force that would be using facial recognition on body cams. Based on the performance that we've seen, I'm not sure how you would use facial recognition on a body cam that would make any sense at all, right? I think you'd find it, uh, the police would use it for all of a day and a half and then decide it didn't work uh, worth beans. So anyway, here's some existing uh, legislation. Now, the question then that we're really seeking to answer is, does the government use facial recognition for surveillance? I've got here a Supreme Court case from 2017 called Carpenter versus United States. It had nothing to do with facial recognition. It had to do with cell phone recognition, right? And here's what the Supreme Court said. Let me give you a little background on the case. It was found that there were all of these convenience store robberies. And every time there was a convenience store robbery, Mr. Carpenter's cell phone was found to be in the area. I think there were a total of six convenience store robberies. And every time the cell phone records of his cell phone provider showed that he was in that very area. And they wanted to introduce that information in court. The government was able to obtain 12,898 location points cataloging movements over 127 days, an average of 101 data points per day from historical cell site records. These records give the government near perfect surveillance. All right. Now, why in the world would the government try to use something as imprecise and inaccurate, requiring full frontal images with plain background on cameras that are placed at eye height, when nearly everybody in our society carries at some point a cell phone, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Now, let me go back to the, the, the previous slide then. Two slides back, 
Whoops, three slides. Blah. Did I miss it? I missed it. I went over it. Oh, uh, here, the proposed federal legislation. The legislation talks about forbidding directed surveillance without a warrant. I'm not sure what directed surveillance using facial recognition is. I don't know how that is defined. This act certainly doesn't define it. And it seems to me, if I want a directed surveillance, I want to find out where you personally are at every minute, I'd get your cell phone number and I would use your cell phone to track you. I wouldn't try to put cameras up all over the city and try to find you on every camera. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. So this act would outlaw directed surveillance using facial recognition except by warrant, and I'm not quite sure what directed surveillance using facial recognition would be, but it doesn't strike me as reasonable. It's just not technologically realizable. Okay, but so the question would be, what can we do with facial recognition when adjudication mechanisms are available? That is, when there's someone that can look at this and say, no, no, the machine was wrong, you're the person on the passport. Okay, well, we can compare you to your passport at border crossings. And uh, we've got a, a, a paper you can uh, download from the, the German government about how they do that. Right there, there's the, the website. And that seems to work pretty well. As I said, it's being used in Germany, it's being used in Finland, Portugal, UK, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand. Seems to be working quite well. And those times where you do not appear to be the person on the passport, we just direct you to the primary line. And the passport officer looks at you and says, yeah, that's your face. Right? So there's an adjudication mechanism in place. We could search passports and visa applications against image databases for possible duplicates. We're not going to find all the duplicates. We're going to find some duplicates that aren't really duplicates because they're false positives. And in fact, the State Department is doing that. And here's a report by the U.S. State Department from, uh, it was done, the, the report was given in about November of uh, last year. It was done just about 12 months ago by the U.S. State Department on how they are using facial recognition to search passport and visa applications for possible duplicates. They don't find all the duplicates, and some things they find as duplicates turn out not to be duplicates, but it gives them a tool, right? We can prevent the repeated dispensing of toilet paper. I put this up. It's a BBC story about uh, what is said to be going on in some Beijing parks. Now, the Beijing parks were worried that people were stealing toilet paper from them. So what you got is a facial recognition system. To get the toilet paper, you have to have your picture taken. Your picture is compared to everyone who's had toilet paper in the last 10 minutes. If your picture matches anyone who's had toilet paper in the last 10 minutes, it doesn't dispense toilet paper. In the event that it's made a mistake, you can go to a kiosk and you can explain, no, that wasn't me after all, right? <laughs> I think it's very interesting, very interesting application. And lastly, we can have law enforcement, uh, we can search law enforcement databases for, uh, for investigative leads. Uh, the FBI does indeed do this. Uh, they have a, a site in West Virginia that's co-located with their national fingerprint system. The national fingerprint system is called NGI, uh, Next Generation Identification System. They have a system there that can search facial images against a very large database of facial images and they returned to say that, and the FBI can pick this number, between, the, between 20 and 50 of the closest matches in their database. And then a human, I've seen this happen, I've seen this, the human's got two screens, and the humans compare these images side by side using manual adjudication techniques for which we're also developing standards, right, to determine whether or not these two people could be the same person. They think they're the same person, and they launch an investigation, right? Now, I, we, we think we know who, who this uh, perpetrator is, right? But most of the time, these 50 images come back are not the person we're looking for at all, right? They're just 50 closest images. Okay. Um, so now this question is the one that's left for you. We've gotten to the end of the lecture, and I apologize. I've gone 10 minutes too long. What should we be doing with automated facial recognition technology? Now you know how it works. You know how well it does or doesn't work. You know that if we try to unload 480 people off an airplane, we'll get 354 out of them before we have out of the plane before we have 10 people that have been falsely recognized, right? We know that unless you can get a plane background and people looking straight ahead with even lighting, our chances of making a false positive or a false negative error are pretty high. But there are some things we can do when we have an adjudication mechanism, meaning something bad happens, you can go to somebody and say, no, no, that's not my face, or yes, that really is my face in the passport. All right, so I'd like to hear from you now as to what you think the path forward ought to be for these technologies.
do, do they frighten you? Do they anger you? Do you think this is an important law enforcement tool? Do you think we ought to pass this Coons Lee bill, not allowing uh, directed surveillance searches to go on without a warrant? What should we do with this? I think we have some microphones. I'm, I'm looking for someone to give me a thank you.